Hi everybody, welcome back to House Polished and uh, it's our first review for episode one of season eight and just say hi to Bubba and Meridian and Margaret in the chat. Thanks so much for being with us today. I of course have Claire and Lisa here as well and we're going to talk all things Game of Thrones. I don't think we're going to waste much time. I think we're going to jump in straight away. I kind of um, I kind of gave you guys a bit of a like extensive list of conversation points, discussion points during the mm -hmm. week and Lisa added to it as well. So um, I thought be probably best to start off maybe with um, our polish choice because we always do a choice of polish, something that maybe kind of sums up, gives a quick synopsis of the episode for us and our um, review of our score out of 10. So uh, Claire, do you want to go first? Yeah, well, I was going to choose, you know, a Game of Thrones themed polish, but <clears throat> I think the look of this is very sort of ethereal, wintry. This is an Arda's Nails. It's from the Brights collection. I've literally just put the collection review, swatch and review video up this morning. And this is from this collection. And it's got that blue flash in there as well that kind of reminds me of the oncoming battle with the with the dead but that is my polish for today I've, and I've, I've been wearing this a couple of days actually I just don't want to take it off I love it it's gorgeous it's really nice so um why did you pick that polish for this episode uh well I I kept it on rather than picked it because of the blue flash in there and it just mm. reminds me of winter it's got that wintery vibe yeah okay and your score out of 10 for the episode uh, my score out of 10, I've given this episode 8 out of 10. Um, the only reason, really, there's two reasons that I marked it down. One was because I, I was hoping for, as, as good as the reunions were, I was hoping for just a little bit more with the reunions, just more emotion, more reaction. I, I, I don't know. And secondly, there were a couple of points in this episode, as much as I love comedy, there was a couple of like comedic moments that just felt like I'm not it just not sure that that's appropriate. And it just feels like a real obvious. Let's all have a bit of a laugh now because it gets really dark and grim later on down the line. And I just felt like that was a little bit too sort of obvious. But the rest of it, I mean, my God, we get to see the the everything that we've been talking about for years will John ride a dragon and will he find it all in one episode? I never thought it would all be. I got my one. make a wish. <laughs> <laughs> so for those, it would have been a solid sort of 10 out of 10. Really looking forward to seeing this episode again. I know it wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but I would mark it down to an eight for those couple of reasons. So eight out of 10 for me. And before we move on to Lisa, Bran wants suggestions. Hi, Bran. It's so nice to see you. Bran, to go with that lovely bearded look, I think we'd go for something textured, maybe. Something mm -hmm. with bar glitters. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so nice to have you. Thank you so much. And Peter, how are you? Nice to have you here, too. I hope I didn't miss anyone. So, Lisa, what did you think? What was your polish and your score? Can't hear you, Lisa. <laughs> Found. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> I picked Prison Polish Throne of Lies because every thing thrown is going to Throne of Lies. <laughs> so we have um, Cersei who's sitting on a throne, not hers, and uh, Daenerys who has now been kicked off by her her nephew. So that is why I picked that one. <laughs> That's also a gorgeous unicorn pea polish that uh, Miss Claire and, inspired I, me to get. And me. So that's I, why I, I picked that, that one. Well, Did you? Yeah. <laughs> See, you're just influencing everybody. <laughs> just spending that money. Um, I gave this um, a 7 out of 10. I felt that there was lots of really great reunions in it, but it just didn't move quick enough for me. Considering we only have six episodes in this season, it just didn't move quick enough. You know, there, was, there were scenes that just kind of dragged a little bit that could have been a little bit quicker. So. That's my. That's why I gave it a seven. Yeah, I think um, non a lot of non book readers had a problem with this episode for that reason. The pacing was a, just a little bit too slow. I think they were stuck between a rock and a hard place when it came to the pacing because they're trying to get reunions done that people are anticipating for years. So you can't go too quickly through them, but you also 
like you can't spend too much time on them so i think it definitely showed in this episode how difficult it was to achieve that i am um, I, well, I obviously I'm going to be the most enthusiastic person here because I give it an eight and a half out of ten. Um, I'm giving it, I'm docking it a half point because no ghost, and um, a full point because uh, yeah, the pacing was a little bit off for me as well. Um, I also kind of I missed out on Brienne not being there, but we can talk about that as we get into it. I'm, I there's I, I was a bit worried because Brienne didn't show up in this episode just just quick glance of her so that kind of worried me a little bit um and my polish is the night is dark and full of terrors because one of the best scenes in this episode is that um is that scene at at that last hearth with uh, Ned Umber and man was that frightening and it just took me straight back to the pilot that opening shot with um Royce in the woods and stuff like that that horror moment I want more horror from the show this 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 season and I think we're getting it um I do agree with the comedy thing as well Claire it kind of it worked in places it didn't in other places opening with a balls joke is a bit weird and um, the first line in two years is a balls joke um yeah a bit strange um but in general yeah I loved the the opening scene and um, so before we move into the opening scene i th thought we might talk a little bit about the change of credits um and I, I should have said i i've watched some things this this week but i've kind of limited myself to not watching too much because obviously i i don't want to be just responding to other people's ideas i want to try i made most of my notes without watching anything but a couple of things I watched and I'll mention if I if I saw anybody's ideas that I liked during the week I'll mention them obviously but yeah the credits so what did you think of the credits Claire anything stand out to you um I <clears throat> I really liked the 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 the, 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 the sort of blue tiles you know and you go through the wall and you see the sort of the progress of the march of the dead and and yeah people have spoken this week about apparently that's going to change each episode so you yeah can kind of I, I actually have a shot of it here if, if people haven't seen it i can show yeah. you um i can show you that uh it is here so if you didn't notice that in the credits can you see that claire yeah 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 there's the blue tiles and they kind of so that's i guess that's winter coming towards last hearth um yeah. the interesting thing about this is they haven't changed kits they haven't changed the sigil for john I didn't know if there's something there yet. Mm. He's still very much stark, but yeah, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, no, the, well, with Last Half in particular, I know it's not exactly the same, but that swirly effect, I just noticed this time, the last time, I just watched it again for a rewatch for a second time. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, I noticed the spiral that's kind of, and, and it's like, is that just a feature of Last Half or is that some sort of marker of this is, you know, this is another location that's, that's it down, winter has come. But I also like the fact that, and this is perhaps getting a bit too deep, I first described it as bricks, like blue bricks, but then it's actually, when I saw it again, it's not, it is like those flipping tiles that flip backwards and forwards, which just kind of made me think, how many times has this happened? And it's gone back again and that kind of balance. So I did like that. I, I love the fact that we get into the Winterfell crypts in the opening scene, uh, in the opening credit um, like montage, and which obviously just makes us, you know, we there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the crypts and, and that's going to be a, a, a key location. So that was really quite exciting. Interesting that the um, <clears throat> the sigils, the only sigils that I could see were now remains, uh, the dragon, the lion, the wolf and the stag. So I couldn't see any roses or kraken or sun sigils or anything. So they're very much going to be focused on the Starks, the Lannisters, the Baratheons and the Targaryens um, for this season. But yeah, really enjoyed the, the opening credits. What did you think? Um, I thought that I was, I'm kind of worried about those blue tiles. <laughs> now that I'm aware of it, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to spoil episodes for me. Um, but I mean, it's very possible we could get, I guess we could get a cold open at any time and that's how they'll introduce where the Night's King is. Um, 
Lisa, what did, what did you think of the credits? I love them. They were so, it, just the detail that they put into those credits. Like that must be like half their budget because I mean, where's Ghost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just thought mean <laughs> like the detail in the crypts and at at, um, at um, King's Landing with the throne room and everything was just amazing. So I think we're going to have a lot going on in the crypts just because they seem to be really focusing on that in the the credits. And the other thing, did you guys notice that the the globe thing that had different images on it. Mm -hmm. I actually well. have them here. If you want to talk you about them, I can show I can pull them up. Um, let me just show them here. Yeah. Cause there, if you want to, uh, maybe I have to be talking to talk about them, but we'll see. Uh, so what, sorry, sorry, Lisa. That's okay. <laughs> I just noticed that they were different. I think one, I was reading something on it and said one of them was like the birth of the dragons. So the first one is the birth of the dragons is there. The first one is this one. It's the okay. the night king with the dragon taking down okay, the, the wall. The wall and the key here is also the ravens. So this uh. is representing well, it could be ravens or crows, I guess, but I th I think it's probably representing Bran, right? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Um but yeah. And then the next one is this one. This is the next one that you see is the Red Wedding. So yep. we've got a line with a fish here. So Lannister and Tully. We've also got, I think this is um, like arrows through a kind of, it, it's hard to make out, but it looks like a, a beheaded wolf. Because then we have over here, we have a Bolton with the the head of Rob Stark, I guess. And Poor old then, Rob. Yeah. And then the last one is is exactly what you said. You've got the dragons. Uh, there's four dragons here. So we've got this big mama one, which I guess is Danny. And we've got a, the t three little ones here. And then we have the comet, which kind of has a dragon's head on it almost. Um, so that for me was really significant because it really does a link the comet with the arrival of dragons, which I thought was significant. Yeah. I, I like the that they have changed it up a little bit just so it's you know this is what's happened now so they're changed like history is changing so I guess that's why they changed it in the in the opening it was really I really enjoyed the opening though really yeah good. so um the, the these have changed before throughout the throughout the series um but mainly focusing on past Baratheon history and Targaryen history like the doom and Robert's rebellion and Robert's uh, coronation and things like that um but here i i is interesting because becca ann mullins on geek chat one during the week made a really interesting comment about how we're kind of turned against danny a little bit in this episode and the way she saw it was that this might be evidence of sam being the ultimate narrator that now we have sam within Daenerys's vicinity we're now going to get this maybe the influence of a biased narrator in a way because I felt like at the end of that episode I've never mm -hmm. disliked Danny more <laughs> at the end of this episode and I think as well just with these three scenes so you've got the the fall of the wall red wedding birth of dragons um they're also going like backwards in time so mm -hmm. it's almost like uh it is almost like we're getting a hint of what's what will be historically significant to the writers of history in the future. Um, that it isn't going to focus, really interestingly, it isn't focused on the Iron Throne or any throne, because this is the Game of Thrones, but it's mm. not about that anymore. This is got, There's something bigger. What made me, what's really interesting about that is why Red Wedding? Why is the Red Wedding there? Is it, is it, something that we should read into or is it a show thing is this the show saying these are the three biggest things we've ever shown you in this series and maybe we're going to show you something like them again so we've got like the fall of the wall but are we going to get a red wedding 2.0 are we going to get maybe uh, this kind of jumped into my head uh, like just literally just about an hour ago if we get a red wedding 2.0 could it be Cersei killing Euron on their wedding night or something like that could it be something that it has to be something that shifts the entire like the entire history of Westeros on its head um and then the birth of dragons are we going to end with the death of dragons or are we going to get more births of dragons but I just thought for me it definitely shows 
a historical bias towards magic as well and towards acknowledging the impact of magic magic on Westeros. So we're definitely moving away from maester, traditional maester um historianship, if you like historianship, if that's the word. Um and moving, I think, towards more a Sam or even a Tyrion-led kind of um, history, if you like. So that's what I I, I kind of was trying to process them. Um, what so, I basically, don't... so basically you went really in deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did, definitely. Yeah. Oh, trademark, trademark. I think, I think you're right. I think there is definitely something there about and I know this is fresh off our reread, so forgive us, Lisa. But there are going to be some key themes that I think will be picked up. Maybe I know I keep saying they're different vehicles, but it's this is hard. It's hard because look, a, a thousand has been mentioned a couple of times in this episode. So you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. I think it is about time. I think it's about the balance of time. I think there is back, backwards and forwards in relation to time. I think those age-old concepts in lit literature and in, 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 in screenwriting around, um, you know, the same mistakes being made again and sins of the father and this has all happened before and those kind of concepts are very familiar to viewership and I think there is something there about time and going backwards and forwards whether that's just going to be in a microcosm of Bran's experience as a character or whether there's going to be a broader oh my god we didn't realize this happens every thousand years or whatever you know I, I think there is definitely something there but into I, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn with the whole Danny thing yeah I could see the smirk on her face when the dragons went over and but for me, the immediate because I thought I, I, when I was rewatching it, I thought, "How? What? What just jumps into my eyes the minute Game of Thrones comes back on the screen?" And it was winter, and it was snow. It was that real feeling of just the colours and everything, and the snow, and the young boy running through the, the snow, and it matches the frosty reception that Danny gets when she arrives in the north, and John because like. Nobody seems to really know what John is now, but I, I get that. I understand all of that, and I can understand people kind of going, oh, yeah, you know, Danny, we're going to have to watch you. You're going to betray X, Y, and Z. But did you see the amount of troops that they were yeah. they, they were kind of coming over the hit? How on earth are they going to – that immediately would give – I would give them a frosty reception. You're taking my food – my family's food, we'd accounted for this over the winter. I don't really care who you are for great thanks. If you're gonna come and help us, you've got dragons, you've got what but how are we gonna manage this? Mm. So yeah. Yeah, um just before we jump any more into the opening scene, um Peter yeah. says season one to seven are always shown in reverse or in chronological order. This season is going in reverse. And Margaret said that she definitely sees Danny in a new light after this mm -hmm. episode. Um, and Meridian says, major props to Sam's actor. He did a fantastic job. Yeah, yes. we'll definitely be talking about John Bradley. I definitely MVP for this episode. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Sorry, uh, there was another point that I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, Peter said, not gonna happen, but what if Danny demands uh, Sam give her his sword? Oh, Peter, I don't know, that's, Gosh, if that happens, that would be super awkward. But yeah, but this we, we'll get you, it. You, you're right in that this is perhaps the beginning of being able to demonstrate why narration can be so unreliable. Here, here's a reason why, and it's really justifiable. We we were, but that that pulled on the heartstrings that scene. So yeah, you can see how somebody, even somebody really kind of learn learned, would would put. A, a twist and a, a spin and angle on on written history. Also, from a book perspective, they those three scenes um, reference potentially the three most significant magical events in the books. Um, mm. Well, with the wall, if it falls, that would be quite magical. Um, obviously, the birth of dragons, but also with the red wedding, we didn't see it in the show. 
But that does lead to Lady Stoneheart and we don't know what she is going to do or who she potentially could save or whatever. So there's uh, there could be something in that. But anyway, we won't talk any more about the books, Lisa, I promise. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the opening scene. Lisa, what did you think about the opening scene? Oh, you're still on mute there. Yep. There we go. I love the um, just the whole full circle with the little boy running up to get a better view of the, the, the troops coming in the same way it was episode one of the first season with the Baratheon army and the Baratheons arriving. It was just complete full circle. It was really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was, it was very satisfying just as a, as a viewer, just to have that full circle moment. It was like a, it was an episode full of full circle moments. So I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I completely agree with you, Claire, about the frosty, frosty um, um, welcome that uh, Danny and John both received. Um, and this episode, Danny, oh my goodness. It's the first episode where I just did not like her. I really did not like her whatsoever. And I like Danny. So it's like, um, I so totally I agree with you. I'm totally yeah. with you on that. Yeah, I just did not like her whatsoever. Just that she just seems smug and um, full of herself. I couldn't. I just. I could not stand her in this episode. So we're but not I really seeing enjoyed... like the the friendly side to her that yeah. we we had no friendly moments. Even with oh, John, come on, come on, girls. She did try with that moment with Sansa. That kind of awkward meet the oh. meet the folks <laughs> moment of like. The North is beautiful, as are you, my lady. And it was just yeah, like... Sounds of straight through her. <laughs> she did. Yeah, she might she regret did. saying that when we get to it. I'll be like, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the only like soft scene we saw with Danny was with John. And even then it was like, kiss your queen. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you into in the bedroom department there? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe she's into some Fifty Shades stuff. Instead of call me master, call me queen. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Fifty Shades of Targ. Um, yeah, I it's it, it, I love like you. You messaged me during the week to talk about the parallels between this and the, pi the pilot because they were all over the place. And there was even mm -hmm. one that they that um, Callum is a Callum pointed out as well during the week about yeah. maybe or it could have been DJ that pointed out about like even at the end with Jamie in the pilot he takes off his helmet and like his blonde hair goes everywhere and here he takes off his hood and it's like he's he's darkened his hair and he's he's not in the same position as he was in the pilot and it's really nice uh that's a really nice catch i thought as well that that was a really good spot as well um uh for me i i i know that a lot of people hated it i thought they did a brilliant job with aria and the three guys coming in. And I'll tell you why I loved it. We've been waiting for those three reunions. I'd say if you asked people to list the reunions they're waiting for, they would have been very close to the very top three. And I just thought, here, here we are getting them all in one go. She tr she goes to say something, and I have definitely been in this position before, where I've just become so overwhelmed with emotion that I just can't say anything. And she goes to call out to John, and she doesn't. and. Then she sees the hound and she's a bit shocked. And then she sees Gendry. I'm a bit surprised with the Gendry Arya stuff, I have to say. But um, mm. I just thought that was really well done. It's like, oh, and, and, and it actually gave me hope that the pacing would be better, actually, in the, seas in the, se in the episode then. Because it's like, oh, they're not going to play around. They're just going to go, you know, they're going to show us these quite quickly. Um, the reaction to uh to um Missande and um Grey Worm in particular it's like yeah the northerns don't like foreigners today it's like whoa okay um and yeah the Danny's smugness with the dragons mm. uh, and especially because like John is almost leaning back he's like oh I don't have to worry about this now anymore I'm not I'm not the king um but obviously we know better um yeah, uh, and then Tyrion and Varys. Tyrion speaks first with a bald joke. Mm. <sighs> and that for me, just like, oh great, more this is this is this is the Tyrion we're gonna get in this episode, isn't it? My dad loved that line, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I didn't mind it. It's just like you gonna open with that? Is this the and and you know, Sam it, it may be they're trying to get the audience to underestimate Tyrion as well. No, oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. This is this the, this the, there are reunions in this episode, that's a, a huge feature, but there's also a lot of 
like Lisa said, full circling, but uh, role reversal as well. So Tyrion, Sansa, definitely. Um, the the yeah, Sam and John to an extent, where jo where Sam's kind of you know, sorry, you brace yourself for this, but you know, uh, the, yeah, the. Yeah, I, 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 I thought it was uh I thought it was it was quite 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 interesting with the um with the whole reunion stuff. But yeah, sorry I've Yeah, it's on. it interestingly as well, just kind of jump ahead a little bit with the opening, um there's only two people that wear white in the north now. <laughs> Danny mm. and Royce. Um like two characters of no, I'll come back to Royce later, but Danny, I, like there's lots of jokes going around, where's Ghost? And then like, it's Danny's, Danny's white and red for coat. But for me, I don't know about you, but that looked like they're clearly making her stand out for a reason, but it looks like a weirwood tree almost, the red and yeah. the, the white. Um, like yeah. there's lots of symbolism going on there, but she's clearly been, like even Varys, who always wore bright colors, is now wearing black. So, Everybody seems to be in a grey or a black of some sort. Um, mm. And Royce, yeah, I think we're supposed to be keeping an eye on Royce because Sansa keeps him closer than anybody else. Even if he's not talking, Royce is there. Uh, even before that scene with Tyrion, he's, she's up there kind of having a little chin wag with him. And I wondered, is that Sansa preparing? Is this her plan B in case Winterfell falls? She'll be able to retreat to the Eyrie or... She, she'll always have the eerie at her back because I find it interesting that she's not keeping a northern lord as close. This is the veil she's keeping close. Um, but yeah. Um, so then Peter, Peter's just said in the comments um, just about what Danny's wearing. Someone said her coat may be ghost, and that's an absolutely horrific thought. But actually, symbolically, she does look like she's wearing ghost. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ooh. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. Um, so then we have um, our first kind of major reunion, I suppose, is Bran and John, and even John and Sansa. Um, any thoughts that you want to give on that? On which one? Bran. Uh, either Bran and John. Uh, oh. Or even just that, that whole court chart scene with them meeting for the first time and then in yeah, the great I hall. Mean, the, the, the fact that Bran was... and I, I'll be interested to see what happens with Bran over the next couple of episodes. I think there will be that battle on the metaphysical plane. But I don't think we quite understand the scope of what he's capable of doing at the moment. So we know that he can see people. We know that he knew that Jamie was on his way. But I don't know how precisely, like, can he actually look through the eyes of the raven and see where people are geographically at any given moment. I don't, I don't know if he can do that all at the same time or if he has to sort of zone in. on. I, I, I want to see a bit more about what's happening with Bran, but he's not Bran anymore, clearly. He said that in the last season. So his response to John of almost... It was creepy. It was creepy. And John's reaction to that was like, the, it, there was something off kilter and slightly jarring about all of these reunions. And maybe this is how it had to be. And maybe I shouldn't have marked this down a point for the disappointment around the reunions. I would have expected to be a, a bit more nuanced, especially Aria and John. But there was just something a bit kind of like, you know, you want to go in and like, oh, I'm not seeing you for ages. And then there's just something that's like, oh, didn't expect that to happen or didn't expect you to say that. I think the strongest reunion, <clears throat> really from my perspective, in terms of allies and working together, just getting over this and moving forward and focusing on the, on the battle and the enemy is possibly Tyrion and Sansa. I, I thought that was quite positive yeah. in a way, even though she, you know, she put him down. But that I, I like that was my favourite one, I think, because he got to find out how much she'd grown by her saying things like, you know, um, when she said it wasn't all that bad, you know, about the last time they saw each other, and there was that 
recognition. You know, she turned around to him and said, we both survived. That, se that seems like a really hopeful thing for me in terms of them being able to work together and, and maybe even stick up for each other, defend each other, just even look out for each other, considering politically they're in opposing camps, potentially. I, it's um, interesting because yeah. if you think about it, Sansa has got the best reunions. Mm. She got the she got a great reunion with John, a great reunion with Arya. I'm still waiting for Sansa and the Hound, by the way. Yeah, I'm that didn't happen, we get, did it? Yeah, I'm hoping we get something there. But um, she has the best. I I and I think there's 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 logic behind this. The John Arya reunion wasn't what people were expecting. John yeah. kind of all like instantly was like almost bitching about Sansa. Oh God, can you believe Sansa? Like I needed you there. And it was like, Ari was like, whoa, take a step back, John. I'm, you know, I, I felt, even though he says to Bran, oh, you're a man now, um, I feel like John is underestimating his siblings a little bit. And maybe this is the show sowing seeds of discord between them because they aren't siblings. Um, but I, I yeah. feel like there's there's something, there's something brewing there. Um, I don't ever think that John will choose. I think John will always go Stark over Targaryen. Just my personal opinion. I don't think he's going to. I don't think it's even about family names for John. I think he chooses the North. Yeah. It runs through him like a stick of rock. So whether he's Targaryen, half Stark, whether Ned's his father, Lyanna's his father. It, it, I mean, you can just see the confusion on his face when he... He's going in, and somebody said somewhere this week, those those couple of seconds between, uh, I know we'll get to this later, but the, the couple of seconds between Lyanna Stark is your mother, followed by, it just, it must be like, what do you mean, Ned, Lyanna? What did you, you know, just for those couple of seconds before it's yeah. the Rengar Targaryen thing. So I, I, it just, yeah, I think that... Um, to me, as a as a team, as a like a show viewer rather than a, 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 a analyzing the books, I think that this quite clearly, the whole interaction really between Arya and John sets up some sort of that's not going to be an easy relationship. There's going to no. be probably some betrayal there. There's going to be. I mean, we don't know. We don't know what. Bran has told his sisters off the screen about John. This is John's history. You know, it, it was time for John to find out that episode. But what if Arya and Sansa already knew that and know exactly? That's yes, my yes. question. Do you think they yeah. know? What do you think, Lisa? Yeah. Do you think they know? I wasn't sure. I'm still not entirely sure if they know. It could kind of explain um, Sansa's kind of cold welcome because she seemed to be very cold with John too. And Arya, um, when Arya says, yeah, remember that, remember you are a Stark because he is, yeah, he yeah. is. If she knew that, she'd know that he is, but just not the Stark that he thinks he, he thinks is. He is. Yeah. yeah. Can I just yeah. say as well, John hasn't been around very many women and he hasn't mm -hmm. been around, he hasn't like with the exception of Sam and a few of the brothers in Night's Watch, we know he hasn't formed very many close personal relationships. Um, and I really think it's it's the, the way Sansa greets Bran, she instantly knows something's wrong. Instantly. Mm -hmm. The way she when 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 the guards come and tell her that someone claiming to be her sister has her around, she just goes, I know where she is. Instantly. It's mm -hmm. almost like Sansa can she reads her brother and sister way better than John can. And I don't think it's just because it's, a, I don't think it's just a sibling thing. I think it, I'm worried that John might infantilize his, his siblings a little bit and underestimate the journeys they've been through to get where they are. He's not the only one who suffered, you know? Yeah. I agree with you, especially the way he was speaking to Arya as if she was still a child. Yeah. The way that, that yeah, you know, she's, she's not, she's a woman now. How old and is she supposed to be in the show? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure. Probably, but I mean, 15, she's she's 16? gone through a lot. She's not she's no. not a, she's not the same little girl she was in that first episode. And but she doesn't still spoke to her like it was that she was a child. Like her first question is, "How did you survive a, a knife in the heart?" She's not like, "There's no bullshit. I know what you've been through. 
how the hell did you do it? Mm -hmm. And his first question is, how did you sneak up on me? And mm -hmm. his question does actually get to the heart of what Ari has been through, but he doesn't get an answer. Mm -hmm. And when um, she, it's almost like she doesn't entirely trust him yet with that answer. Whereas Sansa, we know now that Sansa and Arya were working behind the scenes to take out Littlefinger. And Sansa, was, Sansa had to get over the fact that her sister is a hitman and use that to the family's advantage. I think, I think you're right. I think they're, they're, they're something, they're definitely setting up something interesting there. I, I don't think we should dismiss the reunion. No, for sure. Meridian yeah. says something quite interesting there that um, she thinks that Sansa's warging has turned into empathy. Oh, that's uh, an interesting point, yeah. I think she's definitely got different... She may not have those kind of magical powers or the battle prowess, but she, she's got her own... She's got her own talents, hasn't she, Sansa? Yeah. <laughs> her own skills, definitely. She's good at reading people. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say hello to some people. Connie, how are you? Uh, Connie, I totally get your points as well on Royce. Um, I think that's that's really sound as well. It's just interesting that, you know, we just have to keep, bear in mind, Sansa gets so much hate, but she's really politically savvy. Um, and uh, Sophie Turner actually talked about that during the week, how she struggled with depression as a result of the amount of hate that she has gotten over yeah. the years. Um, I love her. I thought I thought Sophie Turner looked incredibly elegant. She was beautiful. And absolutely everything about her. I love her in this, in especially this episode, but overall. Um, I want to say hi to P Sand. How are you? And Sonny is here. And Lady Marmalade, we're so happy that you could join us as well. And um, Betty, hiya. Um, so I hope I got everybody. But yeah, so I think we kind of handled all the reunions, right? So I guess yeah. um, the only other thing that happens before King's Landing is, um, I guess, in the Great Hall, the thing I, I enjoyed was Ned Umber, that little scene where he just fires out and he's not entirely sure who to address. It's really confusing. And it kind of made me think this is like, this is like, we're going to see the loss of innocence in the next generation, you know? And also though, they're, they won't give a fuck about who to address where. I think this mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is a joke, but I think they're not going to care about, I, I, I think they're going to, the power of the ruler will be diminished simply because there won't be as many people around. So they'll have more intimate access with their people because there won't be as many, but also mm. people will demand more. It's going to take generations to rebuild Westeros, whatever happens um, yeah. with the Night King. So I just thought that was interesting. My Lord, my lady, my queen. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, so yeah. And Liana Mormont, of course, is also a sign of that because she just, she has no fear. She doesn't care about her gender, her age, no fear standing up to anybody. So I think that's a sign of what we can expect from leadership, I guess. Did, did um, anybody else find Liana Mormon a, a, a little bit annoying this time? A, a bit kind of like... <sighs> we've, we've done all of this before with this plucky, sassy northern lass, you know, and it's just like... It, it, yeah, I don't know why there's just something about her that I found a little bit annoying. And I think the main purpose of that scene was for us to realise that John really isn't bothered by titles at all. Um, yeah. Which will play later on in the episode, obviously. And also, it just at the preview for next week, Danny is sitting in the centre of the Grey Hall. She takes John's place. So Before move on to King's Landing, can I just ask you both yeah. what you think of the dynamics between effect, effectively you know, I'm just thinking Catherine, when you're talking about there won't be as many people left, you're absolutely right, and people may need to choose between these two queens, these two powerhouses, the Targaryen queen the, uh, the Targaryen girl or the Stark girl um, how I mean, are they going to ally ever, do you think? I mean, this this episode set them up as like, yeah, they're going to be, you know, the, the, the kind of bitchy looks at each other um, and, you know, what do dragons eat? Anything they want, can't, you know, all of that sort of. But do, are we being fooled here? Are they going to end up being like best friends and, you know, ally together against against the army of the dead? I mean, what what do you think about that dynamic? Is it is it going to get worse or better? 
which queen will people choose? What do you think? I think it'll get worse. I don't know about you, Lisa. What do you think? No, I agree. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, if it ever gets better. Mm. I, you see, I, I'm totally, after this episode, I'm totally shipping Sansa and John. There was definitely some sort totally. of kind of t- tension there, maybe. or uh, I mean, there was some very sincere proclamations from Sansa about, of course, I trust you. And, y- you know, there's some building blocks there of like the foundations of a, some sort of relationship. Which that which again makes me wonder whether or not she re- to be that bold, whether or not Sansa has heard something off screen from Bran. Um, I, you know, I I I yeah. I don't know. There's just like I mean, well, we're probably jumping ahead, but will we do King's Landing and we'll come back to that actually, maybe because mm-hmm. I've got quite a lot to say of that as usual. Um, so yeah, King's Landing, we're kind of mushing it all together as one. Um, with the Grey Joys because. It was funny because Ivan, we were watching it, and Ivan was like, "Tick, Greyjoy storyline over." Tick, it's like, mm-hmm. like just it was the quickest thing ever. <laughs> like Theon and Yara, I think that's going to be our last time to see Yara. Gemma Wilson is it Gemma Wilson? Is that her name? She put on yeah. Instagram. She put up a picture of herself as dressed as Yara and just kind of had like, "Oh, it's been like the time of my life playing Yara," and I was like, "Wow, that sounds like." you know you're not coming back or that's it for Yara. I think that 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 storyline is done. Just wanna say just wanna say hello to T Baby and T Baby, we are up to um the King's Landing, uh, yeah. The, yeah, the Ironborn, just as we get into King's Landing, the Ironborn. Before we get into to King's Landing, can I just interject one thing? Um what did you guys think of how like the whole Viserion's dead thing just was was like it was like nothing. It was like <laughs> Her face kind of fell and that was it. Like, where was the emotion? You just lost one of your dragons and you found out that it's now an ice dragon or whatever the heck it is. Like, there was no I, emotion. Like, I felt there was like no she reaction. Was, I felt like she was reacting as much to Bran knowing that as to the not as to the information itself. Like it made me think if anyone is safe from Danny, it's probably Bran, because Danny likes her witches and prophets. And I think she might keep him around for that reason alone. But yeah, you're right. It was really weird. Really Just weird. the way it was like two seconds and nothing. Like it wasn't a reaction I was expecting. Yeah. Claire, what do you think? Uh, I can't remember. I having a reaction to be honest with you. I must have missed that. So there you go. I didn't notice anything at all. Yeah. You heard it here for first. Claire Gray does not give a shit about the wall. <laughs> uh, and hi T baby so glad you're here as well um, so yeah so uh, King's Landing Margaret sorry Margaret had a question oh, I'm so sorry uh, sorry Claire if you want to start talking about King's Landing I'll find Margaret's question well how, the first question I've got actually is how did Kyburn find out that the wall had been breached and that the dead had, had, had entered Westeros unless he I mean, has he got? Well, I assume he got a spy on the wall. Bran sent, Bran sent ravens. They sent because remember that's how John found out. In uh, oh no, sorry. Well, they definitely sent ravens to Dragonstone to tell John that Bran was back. So I assume Sansa sent ravens out to everyone. Yeah, even, even King's Landing. Maybe like they, that's not necessarily. Like, I mean, it's ne- it's news they'd need, right? So I suppose this is, you know, you've got to try and... Uh, g- the guessing game here is trying to get inside Cersei's mind um, why she thinks it's a good idea. Uh, do, do we... Does she... Is she really that naive that she thinks that the dead can defeat one of her enemies, which are the, is the North... By the time they get to King's Landing, she's got the Golden Company to defend her. Is she really that delusional? Or is she on this just fatalist, I don't care what happens as long as I remain queen and in power for as long as possible? I I think, I mean, again, there was a lot of things that happened in this episode that I actually thought, wow, wow, they've crammed a lot in here. All those questions that we had during the long night when we were all speculating about what might happen in season eight. Um, 
and do you, uh, Cersei sleeping with Euron straight off the bat in in the first episode was like, wow, how's that? So, I think I think she really my feelings about Cersei are that she's lonely. She's no longer got any allies around her. She's probably bored. Um, she perhaps wants a bit of a challenge, and she can see a challenge with Euron. Maybe, you know, she did say she likes the arrogance. She's completely unstable, that's obvious. Um, but I think she's... Where Cersei has made poor choices in the past, I think she's now in this extremely vulnerable position, engineered by Kyburn to make her even extra vulnerable so that any choices that she makes in the future are just going to be absolutely appalling, no, no longer poor, but just the worst possible for her and everybody around her. So she's just a kind of ticking time bomb, really, I think. I don't think there's anything clever about Cersei or her plans. I think she's just lost it totally for her to kind of give you on the eye. It's like, what on earth is going on in your head? So I don't know what people think about Cersei. What do you reckon? Can I, can I just interject before Lisa... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hate you on in this episode. <laughs> I kind of, right, okay. I kind of, I did, I didn't like Cersei's decision to sleep with him, but I didn't hate him. I was like, oh, you're on. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> mm. I still think he's creepy. I still he's think totally he's creepy. creepy, but I it was still, just yeah. like, it's like, ah, oh, he's a creep. Okay, <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> I, I I totally think that if she is pregnant, that she's trying to sleep. She slept with him to maybe pass off the baby's urine, urines, maybe. Yeah, that was the impression that, like, yeah. that expression face of, like, oh, like the light bulb went on. Oh, okay, yeah. this, this could seal an alliance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I still She's think... done it before with her other kids, so why yeah. would she not do it now, right? Yeah. But I still think herself and Tyrion are hiding something. Yeah. I, I there's agree. no way, like, when Sansa says that to Tyrion, you believe her. It's like, I think Tyrion is not. I think Tyrion is believing something different to everybody else. He knows something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Lisa. That's okay. I, I just, her, uh, she was so pissed off about those elephants. That was quite comical. <laughs> <laughs> great memes all week as well. For that. Um, yeah. The most interesting thing for me about King's Landing, the Braun mission, which I text you guys, I said, this is Kyburn. This is not Cersei. Yeah. It's evident of the fact that he does it while she's sleeping with Euron. He mm. goes to Bronn while she's with Euron. Um, so a couple of things. If it, is a, if it is a Cersei plot, it's bad writing. And I don't really criticize the show on much, but I'll definitely criticize them on that. If they have Cersei give Bronn this mission, that's really bad writing. She labeled him as a traitor in the last season. There's no way. And also, there's a couple of things about this uh, this scene that are really subtle. So when Bronn is talking to the prostitutes, they're mm. talking about the group that Arya met with Ed Sheeran being attacked. So Ginger Eddie having his face burned off is like Ed, the Ed Sheeran character. So it's like they're giving us fan service and they're kind of throwing this in for people that pay attention in this scene. So if you pay attention to Kyburn in this scene, he is... There's, there's, it's really fishy. I don't. If Cersei wanted, to, really, really wanted to get rid of Jamie and Tyrion, which I don't know why she'd get rid of Jamie, um, because at this stage, Jamie is really her only heir. As much as she might hate him, until a baby comes along, she doesn't have anyone to take over from her that's a Lannister except Jamie. So mm. I can't see why she would take them out right now at this stage especially when there's a war coming and they might and even if she did want to take them out why give it to Bronn who has a personal relationship with both of them and that makes him unreliable and she has plenty of money now just hire a faceless man just or send some of the golden company to take care of them I don't, like there's plenty of other options to Bronn so I feel like if it's a I think it makes more sense if it's a Kyburn plot um, and he could be doing it for a couple of reasons one in my my favorite is he might be a secret rain but that's something else um the other thing is i think he's he wasn't happy with cersei's reaction to the dead coming he wasn't happy with that euron choice so he might be just sick of her crazy and he's just like okay this will send her over the edge 
if yeah. she finds out Bronn has done this, this will send her over the edge. The other thing is he does say to Bronn, imagine what she'll do for the person who takes care of her traitorous brothers. So he might be misguided enough to think, oh, Euron might actually sneak in there ahead of me as her most trusted confidant. But if I do this, I'll still remain her most trusted confidant. So there's a few reasons as to why Kyber <laughs> might do it. But anyway, sorry, I just had to have that out there. <laughs> Well, I mean, the I other think, thing is she had the opportunity to kill both of her brothers in the final episode. So yeah. she could have done it herself then. So why is she sending Bronn off? I can't it? see Cersei being the kind of gal who's going to pay up front for an assassination like that. She's not She's not a Lannister pays the debts kind of person. You know, she's, she's, she's broke for a start. She had to go, like, you know, crawl into the Iron Bank for help to fund the Golden Company. So she's not got, like, you know, crates and crates of gold hanging around to pay somebody off. And I just don't think she would want to be alone in the world. It would make more sense to me if it was just Tyrion on his own, but not Jamie. No, not Jamie, no way. Really, it, I think about the other way around, because she came closer to killing Jamie at the end of the last season. She did, she did, but there's that the, the 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 feelings are more intense, I think, for Jamie. That love hate dynamic it is she she can't I don't think she can survive without him unless she I, I mean, you know it, it, I, I I'm waiting to hear from Cersei's own mouth that that's her plan and that's what she did. And until I hear that in any up and coming episodes i will not believe that that was her order no, no. way no i can't it, it's it's really bad writing if it's her order yeah. all right unless she unless we're going to see that she's completely lost the plot if this is mm -hmm. them trying to show us she's losing her mind she's sleeping at your on she's sending these mad missions uh, i don't know it's not what um, is, can i ask you both sorry if we're going off script a little bit here i'm not sure if we've included this but the Golden Company, what's the purpose of the Golden Company? I think it's just to have a battle around King's Landing later on. Or Is it really just to defend King's Landing as, as she... I don't know. I mean, I, I, I kind of think that the Dothraki and the Unsullied are going to be decimated at Winterfell. I think they're go we're going to see an absolute bloodbath. And oh. we need a living army to be somewhat present in Westeros. I think there's going to be, the, there was a couple of scenes where there was, for me, a, a, a couple of clues about what might happen with the Golden Company. In Right at the very beginning, before we get to King's Landing, going back to the Euron and, uh, and Asher uh, and Yara scene, sorry, where Yara turned around to Euron and said, you've picked the losing side. You've Basically, you've picked the wrong side. I think that the Golden Company aren't just there to defend King's Landing. I think they may start out doing that, but I think they will ultimately uh, be in like the best sellsword company ever. They'll see the Targaryens, or they'll see oh, they'll see the dragons, or they'll see the army of the dead, and they will just decide to you know choose a different side. So. Or leave completely, are, they're being paid. Yeah. You are saying that to Euron, you've chosen the wrong side. I think that also applies yeah. to the Golden Company and they'll 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 turn on Cersei. Yeah, I hope that happens. Uh T Baby, uh thank you for uh your amazing comments as well. Uh she found it bad that writing that Jamie survived last season. Um mm -hmm. but also you had a comment about uh T Baby about Sansa playing Tyrion. It occurs to me as well, we talked about this when we reviewed um, that episode, uh, we didn't see the latter part of the conversation with Cersei and Tyrion. So it's really hard for us to guess their motivations or guess where her allegiances lie. I still think they are Lannisters true and true, unlike Jaime. I think even secret Targaryens aside, they they believe in the Lannister family more than Jaime does, I think. Um, mm -hmm. The interesting thing here is, T-Baby, if Sansa plays uh, Tyrion, she has something that Tyrion doesn't have, which is Bran. So we can see Bran see the other side of that conversation. 
And this is where the Stark Targaryen, you know, conflict or Stark Lannister conflict could come, could be kind of spun up again. If we mm -hmm. see the latter, that would be great. I'd like to see the end of that conversation. Um, and a, but Bran obviously needs to know where to look, right? He needs to know when to look and where to look. So um, it'd be interesting to see that. Um, anything else for King's Landing? Just the, the well, the Theon scene at the end um, with Yara, where he just very swiftly comes in, saves the day, she had butts him, which was, again, one of those comedic things. Some of them are, uh, were more justified than others, uh, those moments. But I... So what we're getting is Yara going off to the Iron Islands to be queen, potentially providing a safe haven for uh, Daenerys later on with the idea that the army of the dead can't get over um, to the Iron Islands. So there's maybe we will see Yara again. I don't know. Maybe there'll be something that happens there that links Danny back to Yara and Theon obviously very emotionally wanting to, to defend the Starks and going back to Winterfell that moment between them of them saying the, the Greyjoy words together th that to me is that they're not going to see each other again only one of them will survive and I think Yara will and Theon won't, he will they'll, he won't survive the Battle of Winterfell the only other thing that I wanted to say about that scene is that's one of the things that makes me interested in the opening credits in each episode as we go forward, like how far those blue tiles get over to the Iron Islands or not. You know, can they cross the sea? So that that's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that map in the opening credits. But um, I yeah. actually found that a beautiful scene. I thought that was really nice. Um, yeah. I thought Alfie Allen looked quite buff. Yeah. Did he did he row? <laughs> like, did he row to King's Landing? Um I thought he looked great. Um yeah, it was I Meridian was saying it went so quick. It did, it went super quick, but do you know what? I'm all right with that. He rescued her, that's grand. Just in an ideal world, if we were having ten episodes per season, that would have been an episode devoted to Theon's struggle to get to his sister and rescue his sister. We would have had all of that drama leading up to that moment where he put the axe in the back of the the guard's head but there just isn't the time which uh funnily enough is one of the writers on the show the guy that he's, yeah. <laughs> he's he's one of the writers that the, the, the behind the scenes stuff from hbo has been brilliant as well um that they've been showing yeah i the, the other thing as well with the the yara she says to him what is dead may never die but kill them again anyway um it kind of alludes to the fact that there isn't really a place for an Ironborn storyline here. Because, like, it's like, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> like, uh, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I kind of, I don't know if we'll see her again. I, I loved her character. Um, but, yeah, just no source material to, to kind, of, kind of beef that out. What did you think, Lisa? I'm glad that uh, Theon made a decision to go to, the, to Winterfell. It just kind of, like, his, his overall character arc his whole redemption arc, it, I'd, that would be the only decision I'd see him making is to go help the Starks. You know, he's fucked them over in the past and now he wants to make it up to them. So mm -hmm. that's why I, I really enjoyed that scene with him him thinking, oh, my sister wants me to go with her, but I really want to do this. And she's she said, then just go, pretty much. Yeah. Basically the gist of the conversation. So I'm really, I'm really excited to see where his arc ends just the whole redemption thing, but I do think he will probably die at, win at the Battle of Winterfell. And like you guys said, I don't think we'll see Yara again. No, the, and it was like an it was like a goodbye to her character kind of scene. It was a nice scene as well to yeah. end on because so rarely do we have these kind of moments of true love between uh, people without there being instant violence. Um, it's like this is a proper goodbye. Um, and I hope, I, I in a way, I kind of hope Theon dies in Winterfell because Alfie Allen is up there as one of the best actors in the show. So I'd like him to get like a really poignant scene at the end. Um, but yeah, so that's it for King's Landing. Let's move on to the scene I predicted. And I went to make a wish and I asked them 
please, please, can you go and include this? And luckily they did it within the week. Um, yeah. The romantic dra dragon ride scene that everybody hates. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> and you guys text, you message me straight away. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, before that, we have Davos and Varys and Tyrion. Loving the threesome, by the way. More of them, please. Please, HBO. More of them. Um, Davos, you know, proposing a proposal. And then we have the dragon ride. So what did you guys make of this? Uh, can I just pick pick up something that's that's uh, going on in the Sure. Uh, yeah. About, where is it? Peter asked... Uh, Oh, where is it? I can't find it now, but about whether or not the Glovers would be next and then Winterfell in terms of the army, the march of the Army of the Dead. And I've just gone and had a look over on the map. Um, it The last half is kind of more to the east side of Westeros, where the Umbers are, and the Glovers in Deepwood Mott are more over to the western side. Um P. P. Salmon said that uh, maybe the army would be split. What if the White Walkers split their army? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen. Personally, I think we probably won't see the Glovers. We probably won't see Deepwood Mart. And I think the. I mean, we can talk about our predictions for the next episode. I think there's going to, you know, the big battle in Winterfell. We already know is is going to be taking place in episode three. But I don't think they're going to split their army. I think there's just going to be that concentrated force marching down onto Winterfell. Um, I don't really, know. Because I was, I was kind of joking during the week that, like, if I was in Winterfell right now, right, say the three mm. of us, house polished, were there having a wine in Wintertown going, listen, that's, I don't like our chances here. I know the Unsullied and the Zothraki are here. Why don't we get our backpacks, circle back around the Army of the Dead, and then they'll be in front of us. Like, I don't, like, somebody's going to think that, right? Because yeah. uh, e either they spread out across the north or they follow a single line. I mean, Tormund alludes to the fact that they're following a direct single line. So I I can't, like, if the Glovers get away with this, <laughs> um, more power to them, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, if, I, if the three of us were in Winterfell, I'd be getting us wrapped up and circling around... Uh, and, and actually heading north away from Don't the army. Don't forget the nail polish. No, we won't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> and we could get some really cool thermal stuff as well. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's a yeah. We'll we'll talk a bit more about that maybe when we get to it. Uh, Reese, thanks so much for coming for stopping by. You're so good. Um, so yeah, so we have the dragon flight. Uh, Claire, you were going to wax lyrical about how much you loved it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, just the thing about D Daenerys and the being commanding about, you know, I am the queen. That was interesting. Where this is just before the dragon ride, where she's talking to John, and she says, "I am her queen," in reference to Sansa. And um, if she can't respect me, dot dot dot. You know, that was kind of cut off, and then they went off and had this dragon ride. Uh, well, she found out about how. Uh, you know, she didn't translate how much, uh, you know, how much meat and bones and carcasses the dragons had eaten. She just said they're not eating enough, which is like, what? That's, you know, considering there's so many people that need to eat and the, and the, and the northerners that are kind of indigenous to the area. But um, I thought, I get the thing that I... I, I I liked the visuals, especially the bit where they dipped down into into the sort of cavern, and I, the fact that he could handle the dragon and he landed the dragon, and it was Rhaegal and all of that kind of stuff. I think the whole point of this scene for me was to soften the blow for John later on when he has the conversation with Sam, because. He must have, anyone in that situation must have been thinking, oh, my God, I'm on a dragon, I'm riding a dragon, I seem to be not dying in the process. I wonder if, no, I can't possibly, really? Could it be? There must have been something like that going on through his head as he was 
riding through that scene, which helped John cognitively to make sense of what Sam was saying to, to him later on in the episode. And I think that's the only reason for me that I got something out of that, that scene. It just made it less painful and make slightly more sense to John as he's hearing this reeling news about who his real parents are. But um, I'm so glad you said that because that was exactly what I thought as well. I'm going to defend this scene. I'm going to defend it. Lisa. No, it, it was a great scene. And it was, I mean, I think the, like I said, visual, I prefer it visually more than the, the comedic thing again about, oh, how am I supposed to ride a dragon and you've ruined horses for me now and all that. It's just, I, it, it kind of lessened the drama and the majesty of that moment for me just very slightly, which is why I kind of marked it, marked it down to an eight out of 10 overall. I, I think they're doing that on purpose, though. I think they're absolutely they're, they're set. Like when we look back on this, we go, "Oh, do you remember that happy moment? The one happy moment we had." <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They're softening the blow for us as well as viewers, where it's like, "Let's get a few laughs in now because wow, is it going to be dark as we go forward?" Yeah. Uh, Connie says, "Tywin said to Joffrey, any man who has to say I am the king is no king at all.'" And I yeah. think Danny said it at least three times in this episode. Is it is that I'm the queen? I'm the queen. I'm the queen. Am I the queen? That that sort of projection, which is completely opposite to Sansa. Mm -hmm. Sansa is obviously the queen. It's just that nobody's actually named her the queen yet. She doesn't even really need it. She Danny's, like that. Mm. Danny's like that Danny's uh, like that the kid that's like I want it I want it I want it I want it like I have kids here they do that <laughs> yeah. that's what well, she said it, that's what she reminds me she reminds me of my five year old my sorry my six year old I want it now <laughs> I'm the queen well, give it to me again all she's had all of her life even in poverty is like the beggar queen and through the the, 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 the you know the Dothraki sea and the it, is that She's always had that sense of entitlement and that mantra of like you, you know, and it been, uh, the uh, there is a sense of self importance and entitlement there that's kind of similar to Cersei in a weird way, which is admirable at points to get mm. her through the most difficult of things. Like it's it's one of the things that I really enjoyed about Danny's character, Lisa. You kind of said that as well, like the fact that she does she does um, kind of get that from within that internal power and way. Although at least I don't know if Brianna had three dragons. <laughs> they wouldn't be dragons, they'd be unicorns. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing that I, you know, when she finds out that the dragons aren't eating and she's like, oh, they don't like the North. Don't you think mm -hmm. it kind of has something to the fact that they just lost one of their brothers? Mm -hmm. Is that maybe neither? That's not a really like, good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, like mm -hmm. they're, they're they're grieving the loss of their brother. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to not liking the cold or the north or whatever. And again, they kind of just glossed over that too. Now, as a Disney fan, did you enjoy this? <laughs> as a Disney fan, like what the whole dragon ride? Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of fantastical. Kind of actually, I have a. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Prince, Prince Eric Appreciation Club shirt on. <laughs> Speaking of Disney, um, but yeah, it was a, it was very well shot. Um, some of the CGI was a bit off in places, though. Did you notice that? It kind of, I in some some scenes, I just the CGI didn't look the greatest. But I, I it just that scene kind of went on too long for me. It needed to move a bit quicker. I think there's a couple of things about this scene just to defend it from a very serious non make a wish uh, foundation. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It really makes John instantly accept the truth of what Sam tells him later on. I liked it was funny, but I liked the idea of him stumbling to get up on a dragon. I think that is symbolic of him going to struggle with that Targaryen side of himself. Um, mm. The other thing is the I think there's actually a serious thing happening with the dragons, with him chasing Janny, Danny on the, the dragons. Um, I wonder, is it foreshadowing a, an actual conflicted ridden, violent ridden dragon fight or chase later? Are we going to see 
Viserion chasing Rhaegal or indeed John chasing Viserion mm. or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, the, the weirdest thing, the thing I didn't like about the scene was uh, Kit Harrington having to snog with his eyes open always creeps me out. Um, and the dragon's just staring them down. Uh, I thought that it's, was... It's know. like the dog watching you having sex. What it was like. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people said it's like do uh, do the dragons embody the people they're named after in a way like is Drogon kind of is that a Drogo reaction to seeing Danny actually fall in love with somebody um, but I don't know I don't know about that um, yeah but I, I did enjoy it uh, but yeah I think this I think the, this whole episode is going to pay off late in later seasons. I think there's loads of stuff being foreshadowed in this episode that we just maybe haven't fully picked up on yet. Um, and then I guess after this scene, we have the uh, another big reunion, Arya and the Hound and Gendry. Um, I I want more from, I want more Arya and the Hound. I want more. Um, Garrett, what did you guys think of this? Well, I think it just showed that the Hound and Arya just, you know, they kind of wrapped that up with a, yes, we have a grudging respect for each other. We're both big enough to realise that we're kind of fighting on the same side and we do what we have to do to survive. Um, I wasn't expecting to enjoy the interaction between Gendry and Arya as quite as much as I did with the you look good. No, uh, yeah, and you look good as well. It just that awkward teenage kind of, but you know, blossoming relationship, right in the middle of this kind of you know, complete apocalyptic meltdown going on around them. Um, but I did quite like that. Uh, yeah, T baby, I totally agree. We were saying that late earlier on. I, I really want to see Sansa and the Hound for sure. Mm. Oh, yeah, that was the one reunion that was missing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lisa, what did you think? Um, the whole um, Arya and Gendry, I really wanted that reunion. You guys know that. I love mm. them together. I think um, this, again, is kind of coming full circle with Robert saying, you have a son. Sorry, you have a daughter. I have a son. Let's, ma let's put our houses together. Yeah. There you go right there. There's your Baratheon and your Stark. Let's yeah. marry the houses together. So I, I can kind of see that happening at some point, possibly if they survive or whatever. But the whole flirtation, teenage flirtation, was really, really cute. I love that that whole scene. And um, with Arya and the Hound, he pre pretty much gave her the only compliment I've ever heard come out of the Hound's mouth, calling her a cold bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a compliment I'd be happy to take. Um, <laughs> Mackenzie, thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see you. I love Mackenzie. She's great. Um, I, uh, I, I'm like, Lisa, you, you've been on the Aria Gendry thing for ages. And I, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's definitely foreshadowed with Robert Baratheon. I kind of, I thought it might be Sansa and Gendry either. Um, but I'm definitely like, I'm, just I'm totally shipping Sansa and John. I think if it's if it doesn't happen, it'll at least be an option or at least be something that'll be suggested somewhere by someone. Like Davos suggests in quite an offhand way, oh, why don't Danny and John get together? Um, somebody else will suggest why don't Sansa and John get together? Because immediately after this, we have Sansa and John, and it, I found that scene really interesting because um I mean, I think it was Bubba actually saying about Sansa so smart. Well, why didn't she think about the provisions bef when John said he was bringing these huge armies with with him? And I would assume that Danny and the Unsullied and the Dothraki have found ways of feeding themselves this far. So I'm sure that Sansa assumed that too. But then Danny did burn a hell of a lot of food to with the Tyrells and stuff. So maybe she doesn't think about the nitty gritty. Um, but anyway, um, I think the, that Sansa and John might be, they, they might be being set up as Ned and Cat 2.0 because Sansa is certainly 
she certainly embodies a lot of what Kat had and uh, for better or worse. But I also think that if Danny gets pregnant, it would be interesting if Sansa had to raise John's bastard. Um, I think that would be an interesting kind of parallel to like Ned and Kat. Um, and I think Sansa has a good point here. Uh, I also think she might be a bit jealous in this scene because they do have a zombie army coming and she needs to get over some of this stuff. But she does have a point when she says to Danny, when she says to John, why did you bend the knee? Because you want to or because you're in love with her? Um, because Danny was going to fight them anyway. Danny knows she has to, she cannot take the throne and have the army of the dead in the north. So she didn't, like, John didn't need to bend the knee. So I think Santa is right to pick him up on that. I know what you guys thought. I agree with you, definitely. Well, I think that that's why he did it. Either that or he just wanted some booty. <laughs> Yeah, sure. that's the other thing. Is it lust or, or lot? Like, yeah. I don't. I think if John and Sansa ever get together, Sansa will be in love, and John will just be doing it out of duty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I don't know. Yep. There's another part of that scene where John says, "Who holds what title doesn't matter, but will it when he finds when now that he's found out that he is the rightful heir." Is that that title is going to matter now, especially to um, to Danny probably, and to Sansa possibly as well. Yeah. I think he, even if it doesn't matter to John, it's going to matter to the people around him yeah. and his, you know, his family are still going to be his family, but it's just going to be a different, you know. I think everybody's going to look to him to rally around. I don't think I think he's going to outlive Danny. I think we're being set up as an audience to prepare ourselves for that. Um, and I think, yeah, there's going to be a whole load of troops that were aligned to Daenerys who are now like, okay, who do we look to now? And two dragons, possibly. I don't know. I think there will be yeah. maybe only one dragon left at the end of it. If, and it's if. quite possible that Ghost has been with Sansa we just haven't seen him yet I mean I think I believe the show confirmed that Ghost is supposed to be at Winterfell I yeah. think um, but Bubba hates the idea of Jansa I know a lot of people are going to hate it Bubba but I think um, for the casual show watcher uh, if John and if Jansa became a thing it might win people over to Sansa um, if John picks her mm. that might might so I I I I feel like it's going to be Sansa that's going to drive that. But I think that's the first time I've ever heard that phrase. Actually, Johnson. I do. I was joking in the yeah. chat the other night that it's also an anagram for Jonas and yeah. Sophie. Jo <laughs> I knew Lee said like that. <laughs> it's uh, she's only doing it for the show. No, I'm joking. And um, they're such a cute couple. But uh, yeah, I just think Sophie Turner. If you look at anyone in that episode, she's the most regal. Like by far, she's the most regal. Um, yeah. So then, uh, oh man, I, I completely like when Sam and shows when when Danny and Jorah show up with Sam. I completely forgotten about the father, the the brother. Did you? I was like, oh yeah, Sam cured Jorah. Oh yeah, lovely. I completely forgot. It, it, it. I was reminded of it at the moment when Daenerys said, "Not Randall Tarly." It was like, oh my god! But that was the the only the only two scenes I think in this episode where I teared up. That one, and the one where, although I said previously the reunion between Arya and John was awkward, the moment where she ran up to him and they kind of grabbed each other, <laughs> I couldn't, I just couldn't help myself at that point. So that was my crying moment of the episode, closely followed by this one because of uh, because of the actors. John Bradley is amazing. Uh, just, Sorry, I was laughing yeah. there because, uh, Claire, did you see Bubba's comment? How can you savages want good things to happen to a Tully? <laughs> 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 uh, sorry, Bubba. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, sorry, I completely got derailed there. Yes, John Bradley. Yeah. Unbelievably good in that scene. Yeah, it's amazing. So good. He needs to win some awards for that. Oh, he's so good. Uh, it really gives me a lot of hope for what they're setting Sam up for in this season. Yeah. 
by the way. Yeah, definitely. I am. It's very significant that he doesn't trust Danny. He and and I can't remember who said it earlier on. If if Danny asks for Sam's sword, I mean that like this could this could be the biggest. Forget about Sansa and Arya and Bran and the dynamics there with John. If Sam doesn't get on board with Danny, that's the big thing. And and Bran understands that, right? Bran says, "I'm not his brother." And not just because they're mm. they're not brothers anymore, but because Sam is his brother. Sam yeah. is John's brother. That's that that's why Sam has to be the one to tell him this. And I thought it was a lovely kind of there was again echoes of the first season. I think it's episode three where Sam goes up on the wall and they, he has that kind of really sweet interaction with John. But John has the upper hand because he's really confident and he's been there a little bit longer than Sam, so he's a bit more comfortable with the, being on top of the wall. But here, down in the crypts, John should be the one getting the upper hand, but it's not. It's Sam. And even though he falls over and stumbles, he has this information and he, he uses it really powerfully in that scene. Um John yeah. looked terrified, right? He looked terrified of the news that he was given. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, yeah, he. It was just like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I wondered as well, though. Is there a part of him that's terrified of Danny and the reaction? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. Uh, absolutely, because he's too well. The first two instinctive reactions that John had were, "How dare you besmirch the name of my father." Ned and Ned's honourable name. Uh, I don't care who you are. You've just completely shit all over the memory of this, you know, the most honourable man I've ever known. Basically, stop lying to me. I can't take in what you're telling me. And so his instinct was that kind of stark Ned. Ned has shaped him. Ned's his father. Whatever you're telling me, Ned is my father. Don't care about the DNA side of things, Ned is my father and you're telling me that he's lied to me and then the the other reaction that john had verbally there was lots of face acting going on in that reaction but the other verbal reaction was that's treason you're talking treason um <clears throat> so yes he's shit scared of danny and what danny's reaction is going to be there's a couple there's another thing though remember we had that scene with ned with um ned with john and theon where John basically says Ned Stark was your father too, Theon. He was more of a father than your own father was. So John can take this news on board and still accept Ned was his father in all but Nate, in all but biological kind of reality. And um, T Baby says, why did he call it treason? What Sam was saying. So this is what makes me think that this is a lot more about what Danny's reaction will be, more so than what John's reaction is, because like and and this goes back to Margaret's question earlier. Margaret Joder asked, um, "What um, will how will people accept Sam's information without proof? Like, is it going to be enough for Bran to say, like, they they can't actually prove that this baby physically came from Liana? Mm. There's no actual like that's not in the diary that the maester writes. So they can only take Bran's word from that. And that will all depend, I guess, on how well known Bran's powers will become. Um, so yeah, sorry, Margaret, I don't have a more satisfactory answer than that. Um, goodbye girl. Hi, how are you? Um, they have the maester's diaries. I was saying goodbye girl, but in terms of where John came from physically, um, that's not in the diary, I guess. But I, I, I don't. It probably it doesn't matter really. It's all about like, I don't know. I think John is. A, I think John said that the treasonous line because he's afraid of Danny. I think it'll be interesting if we have to have a Danny and John battle over this. Um, the other thing I want to just point out with this, our first scene with Sam is him saving Jorah's life from the most um, incurable disease known to man. Where nobody else would do it, he does it. Sam um, and Bran are set up as like the entire se- series, but especially at the end of this episode, as really champions of the living. So if you think about it, Sam and Mira both killed White Walkers. Now Sam does it on Bran's behalf. So imagine she's like an extended 
she's Bran's extended arm, basically, his defender. If Bran could have done it, he would have done it. But Sam is set up, he has, Mira and Sam and Bran have never killed any living human being in the show. They've only ever killed the dead mm -hmm. or ad, ad, um, you know, allies of the dead, if you like, White Walker, whatever you call them, the White Walkers, yeah. Um, so they are really the ultimate champions of the living. So to have that scene go from Sam like is the ultimate champion of the living, he was willing to cure this incurable disease when it couldn't be cured or when nobody else would do it, to um, yeah. Danny isn't. <laughs> Danny is the one that brings death and fire and blood. So I thought that was very interesting. And I think it's going to be interesting to see the dynamic between Bran and Danny develop as well, because she also, she's not necessarily a complete champion of the living, if you like. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and I think that um, that's played out really in Sam's reaction. That's all he seems to be interested in is the, would you have done that? What about you? Would you have done that? Is that what you, he's trying to get a grip on? Like, I, I think I'm a good person. Is this a morality? You know, the, the morality side of things we see a lot through Sam. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, we can take this from different sides. She, yeah, she's been through a lot and she should have a lot of experience under her belt now. Uh, she made a huge mistake there. And that's like, you know, walking into that situation of I want to, you know, uh, I I want you to be on our side. You're a good person. I see that you did this for Jora. You know, what can I do for you? Oh, look what I've done already. I've messed up completely. Oh, my God. You know, and he's not going to, even though he said, you are my queen and I will, you know, I am your subject, kind of, before she announced that, Um he's that that's all he's thinking about is that was that the right thing to do or not would you and actually thinking about it uh she he she's he's lucky that she even remembered what the guy's name was that she you know burned his face off and the fact that oh yeah i seem to remember that there was a younger fella stood next to him as well could that have been your brother um and and secondly He's been a bit too personal about that. I know that's a really ridiculous thing for me to say, but how would she have known? How would John have known? If it, you know, so it's always somebody's father, brother, mother. You know, it's it, it's not just some random person when things like that happen. It's always going to be meaningful for somebody. In this case, it was for Sam. Um, but what would Danny have really? what could she have done in that situation i don't know uh, I think, well Tyrion said she could just keep them as prisoners yeah um, i mean she had to why not try and win it like i think i think he's hardly could have been won over mm. imagine tarly had been in the pit and seen the the dead i think tarly would very quickly go right i'm with you <laughs> I wish it, Danny's I wish very, I am your queen. I have to be your queen. If you're in my camp and you're on my side, things will go well for you. If not, I will conquer you regardless. So which way do you want to go? That's, you know, yeah. that's Daenerys. So my question is, is Sam now the, is Sam now the Lord of Horn Hill? Or why? Like, like this is the thing when Danny just burns random lords. Like who who actually strips the them of their titles? She hasn't actually stripped them of Horn Hill. Like that's still in Cersei's mm. domain, right? So who actually is doing all? I, I it, that's the problem with Sansi's with Sansi's with Dan Danny's kind of method there. And there's some really great comments well, there from. It, 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 we don't know now that the wall, at least part of the wall, has come down. Whether that means that all of the men of the Night's Watch are now relinquished from their vows and they can take part in the you know the realms of men in which case it would take seconds for her to just sweepingly you know place him as the the lord of of horn hill Mackenzie makes a good point i don't think danny could have could put people in chains since she's the breaker of chains but as mm. tea baby says she was liberating people in West, in essos and then burning them in westeros yeah. so it's it's very 
it's very difficult. The closer she gets to the Iron Throne, almost the madder she gets. <laughs> Well, there's a lot, there's, you know, revenge, revenge for what you've done to me and my family, you've all, you know, that's all she's heard about the treachery and the and the betrayals. Will, this is going to feature a lot in episode two, all of this, Jamie arriving, uh, everyone levying, you know, their accusations at him. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get towards the end of this conversation, what we expect to see in episode two, but... Um, yeah, yeah. She needs she works. She commands respect, and if she doesn't get it, there's always that dot dot dot. What might possibly happen if you don't toe the line with Daenerys, and what possibly could happen if John doesn't toe the line with Daenerys? And even if it's not John, what about if it's the people around him, like Sansa and Arya? And there's going to be a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of that until the time that the night. King arrives with the army of the dead and then everything will change yeah um Ion hi how are you welcome Ion had a great tweet today um maybe it was today or yesterday but about um in the books that the fall of the wall potentially could be in a Davos POV um mm. which would be interesting I kind of I, I was saying yeah I, I would actually love that if not a Davos POV or maybe a Night's Watch epilogue or something like that. But yeah, I really love that. Um, but yeah, so I guess just for the last thing at Winterfell and then we can maybe end with the last hearth. Um, you mentioned it there, Jamie and Bran. What did you think of Jamie and Bran, Lisa? I texted you guys. I'm like, my mind was just blown when he's sitting there going, I'm waiting for an old friend. And then Jamie shows up. I'm like, that was the last person I was expecting <laughs> to show up. <laughs> I wasn't expecting him in this episode. No, I wasn't at all. Uh, but when when you see like the the hooded figure like riding the horse, I'm like, is that Jamie? Like just as like the whole full circle well, uh, back to the first first uh, season. But um, just massive, about, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say there's a massive theory in the books about a hooded character in Winterfell. Um, oh, okay. the book. so that 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 for me really played into that that you know who is the mysterious character I'm not saying in the books that it's Jamie obviously it couldn't I don't think logistically could be but it was quite a nice play into that mystery somebody in Winterfell that's uh you know this who is it it's this hooded character who arrives in Winterfell yes and it's Jamie yes <laughs> sorry yeah, Lisa that's okay um What's his name? Nikolai's face when he realized it was Bran was just pure gold. <laughs> it was so, yeah. Like, just the, the hey, how it just kind of like gradually, like, oh my God, it's the kid I pushed out the window. <laughs> there were so um, many great speechless moments like that. Yes, like with Arya at the start. There was great, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, it was, was really, really just the, they're all stellar actors in this. I don't think there's a bad one out of the bunch of them. But just oh. the way his face just kind of fell when he realized it was just also amazing. he loves his character Nikolai like the way yeah. he talks about playing Jamie he yeah. loves he is so invested in that character yeah. and it yeah it's 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 brilliant um I kind of I, I I forgot about the hooded figure actually I didn't the book the book stuff Claire and um, the way I saw it was when he arrived in the pilot He's the Kingslayer, but he's golden and white and beautiful. And, you know, it's like, you know, I think Arya is actually the one that says it's the Kingslayer. And Sansa says, shut up uh, in the pilot. But mm -hmm. here and, and he because like he's like he's the catalyst for everything. You know, his yeah. first thing is to kill a kid or attempt to kill a kid. Um, so he brings death almost to that the pilot. Right. But in this episode, he almost arrives as a figure of death. And I wonder, is it going to be, are we going to get the, the switcheroo again? He actually mm. won't be a figure of light. He wasn't the figure of light we thought he would be in the pilot. He actually became a figure of death. And here he looks like a figure of death arriving at Winterfell. But actually, mm. will he be some sort of light bringer, if you like, some sort of figure for good? And I definitely think they're setting that up. The fact that, like you said, Lisa, the old friend line. The thing that kind of, and I, I wasn't sure, I'd be interested to know what T Baby and maybe um, the rest of you guys, Mackenzie and everything, what you guys have to say on this. The thing I couldn't quite make out with Bran, I'm still struggling. We know he can definitely see the past. 
he can see the present clearly, but can he see the future? He knows Jamie's going to arrive. It isn't just that Jamie's on the way. He knows he's definitely going to come to Winterfell. He's not going to change his mind and go back. So is that him seeing the future or seeing the present? I could like, I've been like driving myself crazy with this all week. I'd be interested to know what you guys think in the chat as well. I think he possibly can see the future just because why else would he be sitting in the courtyard? Hmm. Like, how long is he going to sit in the courtyard yeah. for? It, it, it felt like he was in the courtyard the whole the whole episode. <laughs> Poor I guy must have been freezing. Uh, but I mean, why did else you would see you that, be sitting uh, there? Did you see that meme with the GoFundMe? <laughs> yeah, to, to build the, the wheelchair ramp. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. <laughs> so good. Yeah, it's just something I'm, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I, I see, he sees him going north in the present time. And he says to Arya, I wasn't sure of what you were going to do at the crossroads. So there's limits to his power, right? He wasn't sure if she was going to turn north or if she was going to go kill Cersei. Um, and he probably, maybe he just knows from having seen Jamie's journey to that point, he knows Jamie isn't going to go turn back to Cersei. Maybe. Maybe that's him just, I don't know. I'm, what do you think, Claire? Um, I... I'm just T Baby's comments about um, how he, Jamie didn't seem to recognise Bran at first, um, he, and you know he probably thought that he was dead. I don't even know if Jamie has heard anything about Bran. That's true. Um, so that was probably more of. I think he probably saw the wheelchair before he saw who was in it, and then it it clicked. Um, I'm just putting. Um, uh, a link in the comments which is a very funny kind of um, parody on that closing scene between Bran and Jamie and just what potentially could be going through their mind while they're not speaking to each other but I, I think I don't think Bran's gonna chastise him I think in fact there's when we get to what we're going to be talking about in the next episode, I think Bran might even speak up for Jamie in a in a strange way. Oh, I think definitely. I think Bran is Jamie's only hope in Winterfell right now. I agree completely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So last heart then. Um, in some ways, maybe the scene of the episode. I don't know I if you guys agree I with that. Myself. I shit yeah. myself as well. <laughs> And what, like, then when I went afterwards, I went, no, I should have seen that coming. <laughs> so obvious. Oh, my God. I shit myself. <laughs> it scared the crap right out of me. <laughs> so, so creepy with the oh, yeah. arms. And yeah. Yeah, no, that that was great. Um, <sighs> Did you guys see the the comments, the, 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 the writer, the HBO writer's comments on the spiral? I... I Saw a video, I think probably this morning, actually, uh, Hacks, Hacks Dogma. Oh, I came up on my subscription feed. I didn't watch it yet. Yeah. yeah, where he was saying that the actor who plays the mountain was being interviewed and he basically said, oh, yeah, it's just the, it's a representation of the, the, the way that the rocks were, like the tree and the rock. Yeah, that's it. Around. Yeah, not, yeah. So I don't think we need to waste our time talking about the meaning of that. It's kind of disappointing, but that's yeah. basically what the the say the writer said as well. Uh, it was on Twitter that uh, basically it's just the Night's King kind of scarred from what the children did. So it's a reflection of what the children did. So it doesn't seem like they're going to explore much more meaning on that, which I'm kind of glad I know now because. I won't be expecting any deep. But I hope there's something more. I hope they're going to give us a little bit more on the Night's King's purpose. Because uh, that would be, if it's just him going around just scarring, like just putting spirals down because he's he's butthurt over what the children did to him. <laughs> it's got to be a bit. Um, there's something else that occurred to me as well, Claire, about, you know, the div division of armies. I mean, it's quite possible that they'll send a scouting party to Glover's because we actually have seen White Walkers mm. separately with scouting parties in the north. Yeah. So he doesn't have to send a massive army to take out the Glovers. So um, that's probably what's going to happen. Well, it's the, it's the only way that 
they are communicating, isn't it? Or the Night King is communicating through these symbols. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get him sort of speaking or having a conversation with anyone. So, yeah, T Baby's T Baby's comment is brilliant. That's it exactly. The spiral is the White Walker's way saying the real North remembers. Yeah, excellent. yeah, yeah. I love it, T Baby. Um, and P yeah, P Sam says um, that they won't give us answers until the prequel. Uh, or sorry, Peter says, sorry. And um, yeah, P says the same. Actually, they both say the same. Um, so yeah. Ah, anyway, um, it scared the shit out of me. I, it's, I'm a bit worried, T-Baby. A little bit worried about the, the throwaway line about Tormund always having blue eyes. I hope that's not foreshadowing. It was, good, it was a good line at the time, though. It was a great line. <laughs> great line. And... <laughs> love Ed's beard why wasn't he wearing a beard all the time so it totally suits him love it um so Mackenzie asks and guys if you have any questions you can just ask um uh because we're just at the end now unless you guys have anything else you want to say about last hearts no I'm trying to get Stuart to do his impression of Jon Snow which he's uh, been doing all week and he I haven't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's Who's coming? They keep coming. <laughs> they keep coming because they don't sleep. <laughs> and they're not sleeping because they keep coming. I love it. Oh, all he's been saying all week is they don't sleep, they don't eat, they're coming. <laughs> Guys, can we get some applause emojis for Stuart's amazing impression? <laughs> um, so uh, Mackenzie says, do you think we will get uh, sorry, do you ladies think we get the Night's King in the battle for Winterfell or will he be at another location? I I, I think he might pull a Ramsay Bolton and hang out at the back like he's been doing since the beginning. He, he's been sending the Whites and the White Walkers ahead and he's yeah. at the back waiting for a dragon, right? I've, I've read a theory. I, was, I think it was on Reddit. Someone saying that he's not there. He's with another group completely heading towards King's Landing. Yeah. So. Oh, that's interesting. That's so, very interesting. Yeah. He, like he, he sent his whatever army to to kill everybody at Winterfell. I mean, why not? He's off for, for King's, La King's Landing. Why I read that on, on Reddit. I can't remember who, who it was who wrote it, but it was a theory that was on, on Reddit. I kind of feel he might fly ahead and attack them from the back of the yeah the yeah. that that With could the dragon happen as well pull yeah. a veil on it. Um, T baby, I have to admire your acceptance. She accepts that her baby is a goner because I will never accept Davos if if anything happens to Davos, <laughs> I will never accept a T baby. You are a better woman than me. I can never! tell you <laughs> never. <laughs> um, so, have both of you seen the preview for next week? Yes. So, any idea, any thoughts on what what you what what we can expect to see? I think there'll be a trial, whether or not it's an official one in the uh, in the main hall at Winterfell. You can see it looks like Jamie's having to account for himself. So, this is squashing into the pre-battle episode is Jamie's redemption. Um, I think this will be the first half of the episode. I think he will have to account for himself. And I think he will be very quickly defended by several people like Varys, Tyrion, Brienne, uh, Bran as well, possibly to an extent. And then, um, you know, it, th 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 this will all lead to him joining the other side, but it's only him and, you know, everybody forgives Jamie and so I think the, sec the second half will just be wrapped up in like preparation for battle with possibly the very end of the episode we see the, the like Winterfell being breached okay here's my bold prediction okay because you all love the dragon ride so I think we're going to get another ride um between Grey Worm and Missandei just yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they're gonna force in another sex scene um do you we don't really think... need those at this point. It's not enough time for this anymore. Like, come on. Mm -mm. Just, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> no, but I just feel like... The... Where they, he said, how much time have we got? And it's like, they'll be here before yeah. the morning. I don't want um, that sex scene. 
but I feel like they're going to crowbar yeah. in another one. Um, so here's my big question for the two of you. Will John uh, tell Danny in the next episode or will Danny find out in the next episode? Or will does she find out about John's heritage after the Battle of Winterfell? I think she'll find out before. I think there's going to be a lot of like human inter you know, po the, the, the kind of human politics going on, including Jamie being thrown into the mix, lots of arguments backwards and forwards, and then they'll suddenly go, oh, this really isn't important. This isn't what we should be fighting for. And there'll be a small amount of time where you get, this could be the long night approaching when Tormund or whoever it was said they'll be here be like basically tonight will there ever be light again once they've arrived so is this you know the the beginning of the long night what do you think Lisa I had a thought when um they were in the crypts Sam and John um John saying let's just not tell anybody I'm kind of with you I don't let's just not tell anybody whatsoever. I, that's the, the the vibe I was getting from from John's reaction is he doesn't want people to know, so let's just not tell anybody. Because he and this is this is kind of like the good thing about him already being able to dra ride a dragon because she doesn't need to know that he's a targ for that to work. He can now still use a dragon. He can now say Dracaris, and it'll it, she won't be any the wiser. Mm. So I I I'm kind of. I'm kind of leaning more towards she won't find out until the after the battle, but I don't. I don't know. You could be right, Claire. It all depends if Danny, if we're going to find out if she's pregnant, and um, if she finds out in this episode, or if if that if that even happens. I don't know if it'll even happen. But um, the other thing that makes me think she won't definitely won't know before Jamie's trial because she's sitting center, front and center. And I think with all the stuff going on with Jamie and Tormund arriving, is John really then going to say, by the way, auntie? <laughs> like, by, by the way, is John even going to bring that up? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. I can get my head around. And I know. I, I know. I, I've said this before, and I know everyone seems to be absolutely adamant, convinced that Daenerys is pregnant. John, John, and Daenerys are going to have a baby, and this is the future. But just going back to what Arya said to John uh, that in their reunion, how did you survive a knife through the heart? And he said, I didn't. Yeah. He died and he was yeah, resurrected. You're right. You're right. It's right. kind of like, you know, I didn't. I didn't survive. But guess what? I'm going to be a dad. <laughs> you know, it's just it just doesn't seem to. I, I, I don't know. Like I yeah, said no, before, you're totally right. you're totally magical right. baby, some sort of magical baby. But again, I just think, hmm. That's just pushing it a bit too far for me that he's fathered a child. Can I um I, happy Easter, Betty? Thanks so much for coming along. Um, I yeah, I P San thinks that the targsest baby is a red herring. Um, mm. I think we are going to see a massive wedge between John and Danny with the Jamie trial. I think she's going to want to burn Jamie. Mm. And I think John is going to side with Bran because at San Sanario will side with Bran. And I think John Jamie. Bran will as well. I think Jamie could be the catalyst for a lot of other alliances. Like I think possibly that's when Daenerys and Sansa may come together in a common understanding against a shared enemy. Really? Because I can I can see this brewing a big division and Danny seeing herself as being isolated. Because Tyrion isn't going to want to mm. see Jamie burnt either. No, no. So, and I think Sansa's going to side with Tyrion, so And Bran. Yeah. So I think this could we could start seeing, really start seeing Mad Danny. Really start seeing the start mm. of Mad Danny here. If she mm -hmm. doesn't get her way on, on Jamie. That could yeah. be something really interesting. Um, the other thing, uh, I'm still, I'm still interested to know where Sweet Robin is. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm like, they can't leave that hanging. Like, where is he? <laughs> and Edmure, are we going to see the, the? Are we going to see River Run? Are we going to see anyone ride north here? Well, if the White Walkers are heading to King's Landing, 
that's an area that they're going to have to go through the 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 Riverlands, uh, and and we could we could touch on both of their story arcs as they as part yeah. of the destruction. So yeah, yeah so um, I mean, we'll talk about what you guys think about the Battle of Winterfell next week, obviously. But mm -hmm. any other season two or episode two predictions or anything? I just think that Bran is going to be Jamie saving Grace. That's what I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. agree. Definitely. Yeah. Why else would he have been sitting there waiting for him? Will he even tell them that Jamie was responsible for burn for throwing him out the window? Do they not know that? No, I don't think no. so. I don't think so. I don't no. even think Bran oh. has yeah. made himself no. aware. Yeah, Bran's the only one that knows. Yeah. Okay. If he, does he even know in the show? Like, has, I mean, I'm sure he knows now, but... He knows now because the weirwood, not necessarily because he remembers yeah. himself, right? Um, yeah. But mm. sorry, I'm, I'm listening for Stuart's insightful comments. <laughs> he, said he remembers the flash of gold in the books, but ah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. In the in the TV show, I think he he will probably know. But again, it's that mental gymnastics, isn't it? Of ja does Jamie know that Bran knows? Bran knows Jamie is there for a reason. That's yeah. the only thing that Bran cares about. Bran doesn't care that he got thrown out of a tower. He's not He's not a man anymore. He's something else. So he's a, like a demigod of some sort. So he is, Jamie is important. Jamie is key. I've like, obviously I've said that all the time, but I mean, I, I just, I, Jamie is a very key character here. Um, Where's Bran? Oh, sorry, Peter, Peter says that Jamie admitted it to Kat. That's true. But mm -hmm. so Brienne knows where is Brienne? And that's an, that's a, another reunion I'm looking forward to, Jamie and Brienne. Yeah, I, so th that's a good point, Peter. Brienne is the only one who knows mm. that, that 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 happened. Yeah. So will Brienne hang him? <laughs> will she say it? That would be really interesting, actually. If she's asked a direct question, she won't lie, I don't think. No. Um. Yeah, so um so yeah, that's all I have. I don't have anything. Um so do you got you guys have videos coming up this weekend? You just had one, Claire, for Ardis Nails. Yes, I've just done the Ardis Nails Bright Ideas collection and I will be reviewing and discussing episode two on Johnny's channel, Johnny Be Crazy with Mackenzie. Oh, on and me. On, just as I, you said it i was like oh me too <laughs> <clears throat> i think well do you know when that is is it on uh, monday monday uh, it's eight my time seven your time something like that i think yes excellent okay so you'll be able to find us both then that's fantastic on johnny's channel on tuesday and then we're back again on monday same time, same time next uh, monday sorry same time again next saturday for for a house polished yeah, episode does this time suit you guys does it suit you, Lisa? Oh, she's muted. A little bit later would be better for me. Okay. A little bit later, yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can sort that out. That's no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, like la this time last week, I mean, I'm I'm fine. This time last week, I could barely walk and talk. So that's that's the nature of chemotherapy. But uh, so I, I'm just very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> And to be functioning as a human being. Um, so, guys, thank you so much to everybody who joined us in the chat. Uh, Lisa, you have videos. Do you have a video coming up tomorrow? I have a review of the new Paint It Pretty Polish collection. They're a Canadian mm -hmm. brand. And you had an indie haul up the other night as well, right? I did, yes. <laughs> I'm very jealous of all your... <laughs> um, I want to know, know by now till Indie Expo. Oh, when is that? August. Oh, okay. Good luck with that, Lisa. <laughs> and actually, for any, I don't think there are any Polish people out there, but perhaps the Goodbye Girls still here. Uh, we've also got a special Easter collaboration coming out yeah. tomorrow yeah. as well. Yeah, you're absolutely so right. There's a few of us doing uh, an Easter collaboration with our nail polish channel. So check that out tomorrow. Yep, absolutely. And you guys know where to find me. Hopefully, I'll be recording an episode of the podcast this week. 
We'll see, hopefully. Um, if not, yeah, you'll find us with Johnny and you'll find uh, Lisa and Claire, as always, linked in the description down below. You'll also find playlists for all our other rereads, uh, what that I did with Claire. And uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, have a lovely Easter, those of you that are celebrating and a lovely weekend. So thanks, ladies. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Talk to you later.